Good morning. We're going to get started. Good morning. How are y'all? Thank you for coming. I think you are in for a treat. I have seen part of this presentation and I think you will be very pleased. I am Sydney Day. I'm the interim director here at the museum. Just a few housekeeping items. Please turn off the cell phones as it interferes with uh, Bill's taping. Restrooms through this door, men's restroom at the end of the hall, ladies restroom down the little short hall. Exits, should we need to vacate the building. The back door, the front door, the end of the hall. So you can use those. Today we're gonna to do something a little different. If you will hold your questions till the end, then Judge Bill will bring the microphone around to you and please face the camera when you're asking your questions. Today we have Sonny Hines and Bob Holland. Mr. Hines is a native of Roanoke Rapids, North Carolina. He attended uh, NC State University and has a degree in industrial engineering. He was in the Army. 1956, he came to Lenore. He retired of Nelson Oil Company, His Strand Chemical. He's been a bird watcher since 1940. He is married to Miss Harriet Hines. They have two sons, three grandchildren. Mr. Holland was born in Portsmouth, Virginia. Grew up in Cincinnati. He's married to Miss Anna. They lived and worked in Charlotte. Um, worked uh, for a learning academy outside Charlotte. They eventually bought some property here in Lenore. He was a meter reader for uh, Blue Ridge Electric, and they also had an advertising agency. Have a daughter and a son. He is the oldest of three, has two sisters, and he's been a bird watcher ever since he was a child. And we found out we have a connection through some fa um, people in Kings Creek that they had worked with, the coffees. So I will turn this over to Mr. Holland and Mr. Hines. If you think we're the Bobsy twins, it's because we both have to maintain proximity to this microphone. So come on over here, Bob. We got. I'll talk. I'll talk real loud. So. <laughs> All right. Uh, let me explain at the outset, someone said, well, I asked why so many people here, and someone said, uh, they're here to find out what they've been shooting. Well, <laughs> I hope that's not the case, but just in case it is, I would note that it is a $5,000 fine and five years in federal prison if, if you shoot a raptor. So just keep that in mind and resist the urge. Uh, I'll start off, and this is, we're going to be winging it, and I hope, hope that pun goes over all right, because Bob and I have not rehearsed this, but uh, we've, we've been bird watching together for low these many, many years, and so we sort of know each other's attributes, and uh, so I'll start off, Bob, if I may, and then you jump right in here then. Uh, Bob and I were consummate raptor watchers, and so we kept going up and down the eastern seaboard looking for the ideal spot to watch hawks migrate in the month of September. This, this hawk migration has been going on for eons. And so we thought, well, we've got to tap into this. I recall my first kettle was in 1956 over East Harper School. And I thought, my God, how long has this been going on? And so I thought, Bob and I had been bird watching in other areas. I said, we've got to go find these hawks. So we went to Hawk Mountain which is sort of the consummate place in Pennsylvania down the Susquehanna Valley. And they have a beautiful museum there, a, a learning center. We went there and we were very well pleased with that. From there we went to uh, a rockfish gap at the uh, northern end of the Blue Ridge in Virginia there. Great bird watching there, great hawk watching there. We went from there to Chincoteague on the Delmarva Peninsula on the eastern shore of Virginia great watching for exhibitors and for falcons, but we didn't get the beautios that we wanted to get. So then we came back to uh, Mahogany Rock, which is right up on the North Carolina, Virginia line on the parkway. Went over to Clinch Mountain. This is each year we'd go to a different place. We kept looking. And so we went to Clinch Mountain in Virginia and uh, over near Bristol, great spot, lots of birds. We thought, boy, this is it. Then we went to uh, Pilot Mountain up in Surrey County. Very good spot. 
But what we realized was that there was no place like home. And so we, we sort of cruised around Lenore here and we found that there was an ideal site over there behind Park, what was then Parkway Bank. We noticed that it's Parkway, Certus, Community One, and now Capital Bank on the Wilkesboro Boulevard. It's a great site up there that's up on the embankment and uh, they're very supportive. And I would note that Silvio Martinot, bless his heart, has allowed us to put a convenience station uh, for one of a better word, a port john up on his property up there because when you're sitting out there for hours upon end, you do need some convenience from time to time. So our, our consistent counts here and starting in 2008 have, have led us to believe that this is an ideal spot for hawk watching. And so we've joined up with the Hawk Migration Association of North America, whom you see on the screen behind us there, and we'll see a few other screens from them. And uh, we contribute our count daily. And my wife Harriet does this over the internet. You can plug in your numbers to the Hawk Migration Association of North America, and that evening, you can find out how many birds we saw here in Lenore. You can also find out how many birds were seen at Rockfish Gap, Clinch Mountain, every other site along the eastern seaboard. And we use that information to tell us when we may expect some big numbers coming. We, we always check Rockfish Gap in Virginia or Wagner Gap. Those are two spots that tell us, hey, they're coming. And so we. Bob and I get on the phone, hey Bob, did you see the numbers today? And he says, yeah, I saw them Sunday, we gotta be out there tomorrow. So uh, weather permitting, we're always out there watching it during the month of September. Uh, Bob and I were once treated to a display of prowess of ospreys, and he's gonna tell you about that a little later. I will note that we have had for several years an osprey nest here in Caldwell County on the cell tower behind Lamar Advertising on Highway 321. Lamar and Lenore Veterinary Hospital are right there together and there's a cell tower and they've raised youngsters, they've fledged youngsters each year for the about the last five years in that nest on the cell tower. So next March or April start watching that cell tower when you're going down 321. Lamar expects you to pull in there and park in that parking lot, get your binoculars out and you can see ospreys rebuilding the nest and then come April and May you see the youngsters start getting on the edge of the nest and by August, here they are flapping their wings, they're ready to go. And so they're gone now. Uh, they may be roosting there, but they're, they're all out of the nest. There's another nest in uh, Catawba County, right behind where Institutional Food House and, and uh, Tailored Chemicals is. There's a cell tower there, visible from 321. And the same process goes on there. We also have a golden eagle, uh, a bald eagle nest on Gunpowder Creek. We've, we've seen the bald eagles, we haven't found the nest yet, but we've got bald eagles nesting in Caldwell County, so that's a little information. All right, Bob, jump in here and uh, talk to us a little bit about some of the things you've observed. Thank you, Sonny. We're gonna, we've got a lot of material to cover today and we don't have much time. We're gonna try to be as prompt as we can about finishing up close to, close to 11 o'clock. Um, as Sonny said, he and I have been watching birds together for a long time. Actually, the number is around 35 years. Bob, I got into watching birds the usual way. My mother maintained a bird feeder outside the picture window in our dining room, and my whole family enjoyed identifying and learning about the birds that came to the feeder and to the yard there behind the house. Hawks are also known as raptors. They eat no vegetable matter. They are carnivorous predators. Their role in the scheme of nature is to balance ecosystems by consuming millions upon millions of small animals, especially rodents and small birds. Our county is blessed to be on one of the flyways that hawks use as they move seasonally around the continent. Some of our hawks migrate over great distances. Others migrate only a few hundred miles. Today we'll be talking about all of our hawks. There's approximately 16 or 17 different species of hawks in North America. And we're gonna be talking about, we don't have time to talk about each one completely individually, but we will talk to you today about some of the uh, characteristics of some, some of those species. 
The bird that we see the most of in Caldwell County and anywhere along hawk migration routes in the country or even in Mexico and Central America is called a broad wing hawk. It's a small hawk, but uh, there are many more of them than there are most kinds of hawks. And during the migration, they tend to migrate all at once, so it gives you more to, to see. In other words, I don't mean they all come at once, but they come over a fairly short window of time. Our red-tailed hawks, which many of you are familiar with, uh, tend to migrate in patchily. They move along following the highways a lot because the highways present good food sources for them. But they don't, they don't just get up in a big group and all come at once. Uh, Sonny's going to tell you about some of the numbers of hawks we've seen here in Lenore in just a few minutes. Some of you may be familiar with this best-selling book <coughs> called H is for Hawk. It was the New York Times bestsellers a few years ago. Excellent book, by the way. In, in Caldwell County, H is Pines is for Hawk. <laughs> Sonny is and the, Holland Fox. Sonny's the granddaddy because of his advanced age. <laughs> and, true, true. And, and, and his <laughs> But he's the one that got it all started. Uh, what caused Sonny to pick out Hawks? Well, Sonny is colorblind. <laughs> which, which, which is a problem if you're a bird watcher. But guess what? Hawks are all gray and brown and white anyway. So it doesn't matter that much that they're color blonde. <laughs> when you encounter the subtle beauty of a blue winged teal or the orange and black glory of a black Bernie and warbler, Sonny sees something grayer and browner. So he started specializing in hawks early in his bird watching career. After all, it pays for a predator to be inconspicuous. Instead, we identify hawks by their shapes and behaviors. Now we've got some materials here on these tables, which are photographs of hawks and some books about them and some gear that you use to look at hawks and this kind of thing. You're welcome to come up here and peruse when this presentation is over. Sonny's home is high on the side of High Brighton Mountain where the sky is more accessible than it is for most of us, those of us who live in forested habitats at lower elevations. Hawks, more than most bird species, live in the skies. Sonny began noticing numbers of hawks, especially during the fall migrations. This led to his learning about and counting them. Sonny is also our region's most prominent member of the Hawk Migration Association of North America, uh, which we're going to tell you a little bit more about later. We're going to share some of the scientific information gathered by Hamana, as it, as it shortened up as it sounds like Hamana, as well as facts and anecdotes about all the good times we've shared in pursuit of hawks. We'll also discuss our favorite hawk watching sites Sonny has already mentioned many of those, and we've traveled all around Eastern North America looking for hawks and uh, in many locations. And that's been a source of good social experience and fun for, for us and the people who accompany us. Our site is at the western edge western end of a range of mountains called the Brushy Mountains that begins near Elkin and Wilkesboro and ends up with our own High Brighton Mountain paralleling the foothills of the Blue Ridge. Easterly winds, let me get this, well we'll talk about that in a second. Easterly winds are uplifted by the brushies. In other words, if this was a, if you imagine that this is a mountain range here, the winds coming from the east hits this ridge and it rises and it forms a wave exactly like the waves that surfers use on the ocean. 
and the Hawks have got to go. Some of the some of the broad wings here in Caldwell County go to Peru and Ecuador uh, on their migration. And so it behooves them to go there with using the least energy possible. That's why they look for these ground features like the Brushy Mountains to help them on their way. They hit that wave of wind coming over the brushies and they just ride it like surfers or like hang gliders would be another example. I see Rankin Shank is heading back. He's a, he's a hang glider himself. And uh, so they, they do this and they have a second wind, second means of traveling long distances without using much energy is called kettling. It's uh, sunny, sunny landscapes, not sunny hinds, but sunny landscapes are peppered with rising columns of warm air called thermals. And I've got some, I've got a visual aid here. This is not a thermal, of course. This is a, an empty, actually it's an empty metal pipe. But I want you to imagine that our landscapes, everywhere where the sun is shining, the sun shines on parking lots, highways, dark roofs of large buildings. Anything that's dark picks up and radiates the heat from the sun better. Now this, this is a hollow pipe, so don't let that confuse you. The reason I brought this today is that the, the hawks can see these thermals and they look kind of like this column of air that this is represented by this pipe here. And they fly to the bottom of the, the uh, thermal, it's called, and they begin to circle round and round and the air in the thermal is rising up, up, up until it gets to a few thousand feet where it cools. And by the time it's cooled, it's lost its strength and the hawks are at the top of the thermal. And their eyesight is so good, so many more hundreds of times more acute than ours, they can see thermals everywhere and they move to the next thermal, take a long glide, sometimes several miles to the next thermal where they hit the thermal and they circle and rise and circle and rise so they're able to travel hundreds of miles per day without flapping their wings and using up their energy. So Sonny mentioned to you a little bit earlier a kettle. A kettle is a group of hawks, sometimes in the hundreds, usually more, more likely in the dozens, uh, that are taking advantage of a thermal. And you can see this very clearly once you get used to the idea. Okay. I got it, Bob. Bob, if I could just jump in for a moment. Go ahead, Sonny. Everyone, I think, has a sheet with data on it, with digital information on it, not the one with the silhouettes, but the other sheet. That is a compilation of what Hermana enables us to do, and that is a, a, that's a, a summary of September 2008. The reason I picked that, because that was our best year ever here. And you see, on one day, we had over 8,000 hawks. It, uh, it just so happened that, that that day, my wife, Ann, was a little under the weather, so I stayed home with her. And Bob had the audacity to call me and say, Sonny, you should have been here. <laughs> because they had already counted 8,000 hawks that day. And uh, it was, I'm sure it was a thrill. It, uh, it's, there's nothing that I know of in nature that compares maybe a herd of wildebeest, but we're not going to get to Africa. So I think a, a, a flock, a, a kettle of hawks is, is an incomparable experience in, in, in the natural world. But uh, that's, that's the way our data is presented. And all you have to do is put in www.hawk count, the Hamana site will come up, and, and then the, the map of the United States will come up. You click on North Carolina, and it'll give you the option of all the sites in North Carolina that you want to see, and, and put in, at this point in time, put in Community 1. We have not been able to update all of our data. Jeff Coffey has been very helpful back there. And he's got it done, but I haven't been, out, been able to figure out how to insert it yet, Jeff, so we'll get that done. But right now, the site is called Community One Bank. And if you want to go to Community One, 
Starting in September, we'll be reporting our daily data there, and you can find out what we've been seeing. The season usually starts quite slowly. We'll usually see ospreys and bald eagles early on, and uh, we'll see maybe 10 or 12 during the month of September of each, and then as, as September progresses, we start seeing uh, Cooper's hawks, we start seeing exhibitors, uh, we start seeing falcons, uh, and then uh, we'll start seeing the, the Budios in the large numbers probably around the 20th of September of this year. So, uh, but if you want to be sure to, to know what's coming, click, click on Virginia, go to Rockfish Gap, and you look at those numbers and you say, well, they'll be in Lenore in the next 36 hours. So provided the wind provide, co cooperates, because if it doesn't cooperate, they'll be all going over Grandfather Mountain. So it, it's, all, it's all a crap shoot. It depends on cloud cover. If it rains, we don't see birds, so we don't sit out there in the rain. Uh, we have in the past, but it was to no avail. Uh, if, if the uh, wind is out of the uh, uh, northeasterly direction, we're fine. If it's out of the northwesterly direction, they're probably going to be going east of us. If it's coming out of the, out of the east purely, it'll be over on Grandfather. So uh, that's, that's where we are. And uh, Bob, go ahead, if you would, and talk a little bit about the silhouette guide. All right, this piece of paper here, which you each should have one, it's got two sides. If you look at the uh, front side, which says a guide to hawks seen in North America, know your silhouettes. There approximately is, I might have mentioned it earlier, there's 16, 17 different species of hawks in North America. And this, this uh, guide shows all of them, plus a couple of extra diagrams at the bottom that help you identify, the dip, for instance, the difference between a sharp shin hawk and a cooper's hawk. The hawk that is probably the most famous and gets the most press and that people talk about a lot is called a peregrine falcon. You see the column that it's in says falcons at the top. The next column says exhibitors and then beauty is. But the peregrine falcon, peregrine means traveler and peregrine falcons are found all over the world on, on all continents. They're also the fastest flying bird reaching speeds upwards of 160 miles per hour when they go into a dive after a prey. If you can imagine going that fast in the air. They uh, are very dramatic and beautiful birds. They were nearly killed off by our habit of using DDT as an insect killer it also killed a lot of birds and other things. And so DDT has been banned now, but what happened when we were using DDT is that the eggs of the hawks, shells were so thin that in settling in the nest to cover the eggs and warm them, they're often broken. And of course the young chicks in, in the eggs that were developing died then. But that's changed now and peregrine falcons are on the rise. I'm going to tell you a little story about the next bird under the peregrine falcon, which is called a merlin, another type of falcon, a very small type of falcon. Merlins are the Tasmanian devils of the hawk world. They're fast flyers, they're, they're fearless. When you see a merlin going across the horizon, he's just giving it like this, you know, you just see this massive motion and everything. You don't see a lot of merlins because they're small, they're dark colored mostly on the back and the top. But uh, one time Sonny and I were birding out at, at uh, the Outer Banks. Several of us were in a van and we're driving along the highway and suddenly we saw a merlin sitting on top of a power pole. So we thought we'd pull the car over and jump out. We're all excited. We wanted to get our binoculars and get a better view of this bird. And then we noticed that there was a Merlin on the next power pole, so there were two of them, and we got doubly excited. Then uh, one of the Merlins on the poles took off while we were watching and dove down like a streak. They also call them the bullet hawk, like a streak, and tried to catch a little yellow rumped warbler, which is a tiny little bird in comparison. 
they're extremely common on the Outer Banks in the wintertime because they have evolved, the yellow rump warbler has e have evolved the trick of digesting the ber berries from the wax myrtle trees, which are very numerous there. So yellow rump warblers from all over eastern Canada and North America and all gather on the Outer Banks where they've got plenty of food because not very many animals can, can digest wax. But uh, they've learned to do so. In any case, this Merlin came off the pole and got after this yellow rumped warbler, which in a panicky flight dove into a bush. The uh, Merlin couldn't go into the bush to look for the bird because he's larger than one thing or another. And so we all looked at that and said, wow, that was something watching the Merlin attack that little bird. Well, the next thing we know, the little bird, the little warbler, flew out of the bush and flew under our van and was sitting on the pavement there next to the muffler. And they're usually very, very timid and so forth, but the, the four of us went down and put our heads down close to the <laughs> pavement where we could see that little bird and he just sat there and looked at us. He didn't try to fly or anything, he was so scared. So we thought, wow, look at him. He's, we've tamed him with this Merlin now. Look how he's doing. Then the next thing happened is we started walking down toward the next pole where the other Merlin was. And as we did, the Merlin that was under our van the, the came woman. out and followed us. He was <laughs> on foot. He was, about, <laughs> he was about four feet behind us. And as we walked along, he stayed right close to us <laughs> because he knew somehow that we were not going to hurt him and that Merlin was going to eat him right up. <laughs> so sometimes you have these experiences like this when you're outdoors, you know, and they carry your memory for a long time. That was one. Uh, I'll mention that, that uh, the center column there, the accipiters, the northern goshawk, cooper's hawk, sharp shin hawk, these are bird hawks. You can see they have Look at the sharp shinned hawk. He's got broad wings and a compact body and he long tail which he uses as a rudder when they're chasing their prey, which is other birds. They use that tail to make quick turns and, and go after their prey. Same with Cooper's hawks. Cooper's hawks is the hawk that you, you might have heard people call a chicken hawk because they used to be the bane of uh, farmers who had chickens out in the yards running loose. Cooper hawks like to eat chickens. The northern goshawk, we don't see too many of them around here. It's more of a northern species, but they're a very impressive bird. Coming down on the right, you see the third main group of hawks, which Sonny referred to a few minutes ago as the Buteos. Buteos, as it says there, have broad wings and a broad rounded tail. Buteos are the birds that you most often see flying around in the air. With their acute vision, they're up there looking for something to eat, and they can see great distances. And of course, from that point of view of being up in the sky there, they can look down and see a lot of things going on on the earth. So our familiar red-tailed, red-shouldered, red the, the uh, uh, broad-winged hawk that I mentioned earlier, those are all Buteos see their body shape is a little different than the others. Uh, if we turn the page over, you see a, a hawk that we just mentioned, the osprey. Osprey is a fish hawk. You commonly see them when you're at the coast or on a large river system somewhere. And uh, they're very impressive birds. They're, they're huge. They're almost eagle-sized birds and they're mostly white when you see them and uh, beautiful birds, beautiful gliding flight that they carry on. Uh, we have a, we have a, why don't you tell the story about that time when we said, saw it. Talking group. about ospreys, we were at, the, at uh, Huntington Beach uh, one pretty day down there and the wind was just right and so it had, there's a jetty, I don't know how many of you have been to, to Huntington Beach, but there's a jetty for the inlet that goes out into the ocean out there. And, and it, it had trapped a pool, a, a school of fish inside the jetty there that uh, the currents were such and the wind was such that the fish were pretty much pooled into this 
uh, small area and the osprey got spotted it and I say ospreys because there must have been eight or ten ospreys Bob circling around and and they took turns much as aircraft approaching on final approach they'd come down they'd hit that pool of fish grab a fish fly back over land on a post there on the beach and they t uh, there were eight or ten of them that just continually were in flight circling over that pool of fish each taking its own turn coming in making a strike it was quite a th quite a sight to see, Bob. It is a beautiful sight, and uh, you often see ospreys one at a time. But there we were looking at a group of them feeding on this school of fish. Um, on that side, also you see the northern harrier, which is also called a marsh hawk. You see these on the marshes down at the coast, and other large marshes even on on freshwater where there are some. Uh, they fly very close to the earth, six feet, eight feet up, and their wings are held out. Let me see if they've got a diagram here. They don't, but they hold their wings at an angle like this, and their bodies are constantly doing like this, and they fly very close to the ground. And as they go through the marsh there, they're watching to see if there's some prey animal on the ground, and they if there is, they suddenly drop down on it. So you watch marsh hawks going along with their beautiful flight. Each one has a white wing feather patch on. His, on you can't see it here because they're on the other side of the bird. But uh, anyway, they're kind of a thrill to watch also. The males are gray and the females are brown. Bob, I would note that uh in the, in the box up there on the right hand corner there's a Mississippi kite which is an accidental in Caldwell County. We saw one about uh, six weeks ago over the, the old Broyhill Miller Hill complex. There was one circling out there. Uh, the thing about kites is they're just passing through and uh, so we, we just glimpsed them for about a minute and they, then it was gone. But uh, we uh, do see Mississippi kites occasionally in Caldwell County and it's, it's what we would call an accidental, but they just, they just drift through from time to time. Now, Sonny mentioned uh, Hawk Mountain earlier. Hawk Mountain is probably the most famous hawk watch site in our country. And it's in the eastern part of Pennsylvania where the Appalachians escarpment is close to the state of New York. And Hawk Mountain like our Brushy Mountain Ridge out here, takes the wind that comes and it pushes it up in a wave like I described earlier. And all these hawks that are migrating south out of Canada and, and New England and places up in that, that direction come to this ridge and it's much longer than our Brushy Mountain Ridge out here. So hawks get on that wave of air that's curling over the ridge and they ride all the way down it. Uh, back in the, we don't know exactly when, but back in the early part of the 20th century, it got to be a habit of the people who lived in that area to go up on Hawk Mountain, take a picnic lunch and a shotgun, and shoot hawks. And they had kind of in that area, they had a, an ethic that said the only good hawk is a dead hawk. And they killed a lot of them. Uh, the hawks come along that ridge, and they're actually quite close to the ridge to pick up the best air. So as they came along, these people would shoot them. Well, in 1930, a woman named Rosalie Edge, who was from New York City, but she was a bird lover, was in that area, and she heard about this, this practice that people use of shooting these hawks. And she went up there and investigated, and she was aghast at what she saw. A couple of men with shotguns that killed hundreds of hawks in a single day. And just pile them out on the ground or hang them on barbed wire fences and this sort of thing. And so she resolved to do something about that, and she was a woman of some means. So she began buying up the land up there on, on Hawk Mountain Ridge. And she hired a uh, a caretaker and his wife to live there and protect the hawks in all seasons. So Miss, Mrs. Edge was the 
fairy godmother to the hawks of that area because she pushed, pretty much put a stop to all the random killing that was going on. So it took a woman to do that, huh? Say what? It took a woman to do that. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> took a woman to do that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to pretend I didn't hear that. <laughs> Anna will remind him. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, she, she did that in the, the sanctuary that she purchased the land and she got other people to chip in too, you know, buy a big piece of land there. I'm not sure exactly how big it is to protect the hawks and it's still in existence and has a board of directors and fundraising and everything just like a lot of other charitable organizations. So. Hawk Mountain is a favorite place to go, and if you'd like to go there, Sonny, Sonny and I had some fun out of the fact that it's Pennsylvania Dutch country, and we made reservations before we went up there at a motel called the Dusselfink, <laughs> and we learned that Dusselfink means goldfinch in German, <laughs> and it's a very Germanic place. The food is excellent and a little different than what we get in most places around here. They have and a very good polka band up there too, so if polka is your thing. <laughs> when we got to the Dusselfink, we couldn't believe it. I mean, it must have had four or five hundred seat cafeteria and <laughs> restaurant and rooms. And people come from all over the world during the season to watch the hawks there. Bob, I'm going to take a moment. If I could have the mic, please. I'm, I'm going to show you uh, what you, the essentials that you need if you're going to come join us for hawk watching. So I've got a goodie bag over here. So hold on now. Gonna have the mic. This is good. The first thing you need is a chair. <laughs> I promise you, you cannot survive up there without a chair. So bring a chair. The next thing that you have to have are binoculars. And so we have some spares. If you don't have binoculars, come on up there. We'll have a couple of extra pairs of binoculars for you. But you need these because those birds can be as high as 6,000 feet sometimes. So it's quite difficult to identify them if you don't have binoculars. So chair and binoculars are essential. Dark glasses. The glare is unbearable after a few hours of that. So bring dark glasses. You really need these. For your own satisfaction, bring a bird guide, either a Peterson or a Sibley, because we have other birds up there. We have swallows, we have uh, woodpeckers, we have uh, uh, Barrows up, up down the hill, so it's a, it's a awesome. good outing where we even see in hawks you might see a red-headed woodpecker or a pileated woodpecker. And we've got some local birds. You'll certainly see what I call the High Brighton Escadrille, which is a group of turkey vultures that always congregates over High Brighton. So it's, it's fun to watch those, and frequently they'll be joined by a pair of ravens who come in from God knows where and stay a couple of days and then they move on out. But uh, there's always something to see up there. If it's not hawks, we've got turkey vultures, we've got black vultures. So come, come prepared with your, your bird guide. And yes, and yes, turkey vultures and black vultures are also raptors, just like the other hawks we've been talking about. Take it from me, I had my share of uh, all kind of cuts on my face for sunburn. Bring sunscreen. If, even if you're sitting in the shade, you need sunscreen. So bring that with you, please. And last but not least, bring a hat. You, you'll really benefit from, your, your ears will particularly thank you for having a hat that's got a brim on it. So this is my goodie bag, and I, I usually leave it back. But the essentials are binoculars and a chair. And if you don't have binoculars, we'll loan you some. But you're always invited. We're usually up there from about 10 o'clock until about five o'clock. If the birds are moving, we'll stay till six. The latest I think I've ever seen the bald eagle was 6.30 in the high right. So you just never know. There's a serendipitous aspect of bird watching that you really can't uh, quantify. And uh, the other thing is good fellowship. I, I, I think of uh, Ann Miller, Barbara Miller, uh, well, Susan Powers, 
and our good friend Michael Whittington comes over. <coughs> right? Walt, Walt Kent. Walt Kent. Walt Kent. We, the numbers of a legion up there. Uh, we we got a good group of folks who come, but I will note that Rankin Whittington on, on my Chincoteague trip took the best clam chowder you've ever put in your mouth. Down there. So that was a real highlight for us. <laughs> and also on that trip, I called a, a bird up down in Eastern Virginia. I said, "Why can't we stay on Chincoteague?" So he gave me the, the name of the motel. He said it's very reasonable. He's right; it was reasonable. But the bath towels were hand towels. <laughs> that was one of the reasons it was so reasonable. It was basic. They didn't have much hot water either. It, let's go ahead and, and take a peek if we could, Cindy. We're going to look at a couple of slides up here. Uh, this, is the, this is what tells you about Hawk, Mi Hawk Migration Association of North America. And the next slide these red dots are all hawk watching sites and you'll find that uh, we're right there uh, in North Carolina along with several others on Grandfather on Mahogany Rock there's there's one now in Catawba County uh, so as, as we've had success other folks have sprung up in North Carolina when we get the birds from up in Virginia they go on down to a, a spot uh, called Caesar's Head in South Carolina and you'll, you'll note if you click on Caesar's head, Bev's telling me to, to cut it in 10 minutes. <laughs> and I'm ready, Bev. I don't think I'll last that long. But uh, let's go ahead and look at a couple of other slides if we might. These are some of the spots that Hawk Migration uh, Association of North America has uh, their sites. They have a spring migration. We do not participate in that because they don't seem to come up the brushes in the spring like they go down in the fall. So we don't participate in the spring migration. Next one, please. We even have, we watch out for dragonflies and for butterflies. We also watch out for hummingbirds. We report those, not by species, but we report the sightings on our, on our total that we turn into hawk migration. So if we're having dragonflies and damselflies come over we we try to count uh, approximately the numbers they flying like bullets so you don't worry about them circling around for any period of time butterflies are the same way you know the monarchs go all the way to mexico so we uh, we report some of those numbers from time to time and we will have international hawk migration week in september the 16th to the 24th we'll have a banner out at uh, out at capital bank in the parking lot we ask you, if you would, to park in what I would call the lower parking lot so that the customers can park up near the bank. But come up on the, uh, on the embankment there and join us if you would. Uh, it's great fellowship. Even when we're not seeing birds, we're swapping stories and, and just enjoying the fellowship, much as we do here. And if I just might for a moment put in a plug for the, uh, for the museum here. I have had the joy of being a volunteer from time to time here, and I can tell you that these are some of the greatest friends I've ever met in my life. Some folks of common interest who share a love of the history of Caldwell County, and I, you're here today because of their interest in providing programs of a variety and a diverse group of, of topics, and this place would not exist without your support. And uh, so I, I encourage you to come back for their curator talks, not just ours, heaven help you, but for, for others, they've had some excellent ones here. And uh, I think we're about ready for any comments you might have, Bob, in the way of a wrap up. Well, I wanted to say one thing before I finish uh, about an organization called the Carolina Bird Club. It serves both North and South Carolina, and it schedules four big meetings every year, fall, spring, winter, so so forth. And you, they, they check into a motel, they reserve the whole motel, and you can go down there and get a room for a reasonable rate, and you get with their expert guides that they have, will take you out and show you all kinds of things that have to do with birds, not just hawks, of course, but with birds in general. 
And then they get together in the evening and they have a regular roll call of the kind of birds that were seen and some of the anecdotes of what happened to people that day. They have a good meal. They send you, uh, you, you get a magazine uh, from them four times a year. And what else, Sonny? I think that pretty well covers it. They do, from time to time, have workshops on bird, bird identification. I haven't seen any lately, but they have had those in the past. Right. We, we've been to uh, Carolina Bird Club uh, meetings in Blowing Rock. Uh, we've been there. Huntington Beach. Huntington Beach. Outer Banks. All over the Outer Banks. The Outer Banks in the wintertime is such a great place for birding because you see all these beautiful uh, ducks and waterfowl and this kind of thing in, in large numbers. And the beauty of some of these things is incredible. Sonny mentioned that sometimes you see things that are not hawks, which is just icing on the cake to us. Uh, one time we were in Chincoteague, which is the Delmarva Peninsula of Maryland and Virginia. And it's a natural flyway for hawks because hawks migrate down the coast they get to the Del Mar when they go along and pretty soon they come to the Chesapeake Bay and they're hesitant to fly over water. Most hawks are. So they kind of build up there on the tip of the Del Mar until they get enough courage or some very favorable winds and everything to cross the Chesapeake Bay right in the vicinity of the, the famous bridge tunnel. So Sonny and I have been up there watching hawks a few times and we <clears throat> came to this little town in Maryland called Oyster. Uh, that had been, or I guess still is, a major oyster fishing site. And we climbed upon this absolute mountain, must have been 50, 60 feet high, of oyster shells. And we're standing upon these oyster shells with our binoculars and we're looking out over the marshes on either side. And suddenly we saw this black smudge coming from the northeast uh, from the top of our, our shell and we started watching it. And as it got closer, we could see that the birds in this black smudge were tree swallows. And tree swallows are a reasonably common but beautiful bird. They have emerald green backs and white breasts. And they can be quite numerous at various times. They were approaching us where we're standing on this oyster shell thing. And right behind us was a little enclosed kind of a marsh with lots of tall weeds and all growing in it. These birds came up to us and we estimated there, that there were tens of thousands of them all flying in a river across the marsh. They're so graceful and everything, you've never seen anything like it. And when they got to this marsh that was behind the pile of shells that we were standing on, they started to go up a little bit and circle and swirl around and around like clothes in a washing machine, just going around and around like this. And all of a sudden, it's some kind of a signal that we couldn't make up. They started to pour down into this marsh where they hoped to spend the night and roost away from predators and all. And that whole massive cloud of thousands of birds just came down like a funnel and swirling and swirling, and they all disappeared into the marsh. And I swear to you, in five or ten minutes, there was not a tree swallow in sight. We knew that all these thousands of birds were right there beside us, but we couldn't see a single one of them. They'd all gone down and were roosting on the bases of those reeds and things in the, in the marsh. So those are the kinds of things that birding and hawk watching uh, are a real payoff for you if you're interested in the out of doors and this kind of thing. Uh, any questions? We'll, we'll be glad to try to take a shot at it. Yes, sir. Wait, hold just a second, and he'll bring you a mic. Sonny Bob, I really appreciate you doing this talk. <clears throat> I love hawks. I've had hawks living in my backyard for years, but um, there was a family up in this summer that was right next to me, and they'd come down in my yard, and they'd drink my, the water out of my um, bird fountain. And, um, and I was thinking about putting up some stands, some hawk stands, um, 20 or 30 feet, is that how, how high they need to be? And, and do they do any good? Um, for for nesting, you're talking about a, a base for nesting, is that right? Uh, just a perching stand um, that they'll perch on to look for food and stuff. 
Um, they they don't really look for a perch like that because they just perch in a tree. The, they, broad, the broad wings that we've been talking about that are so numerous, for instance, don't hunt much while flying. Even though they're beauty ears, they're small beauty ears, they perch on a tree limb somewhere and watch the ground and then they drop down if they see prey, if they see a snake or a mouse or something on the ground, then they, they hunt from a perch, which is a common way that many other birds do too, because again, they're not using any of their own energy when they're on a perch. But uh, I've, I've never heard of anybody actually putting up a stand that would well, attract them for that they, reason. They would probably be exposed to their prey if they're on a perch out yeah. by, so they pr prefer to perch on a limb where they have some foliage and that sort of thing. Well, here's my real question. Um, I've seen hawks compared to crows in size, different hawks, and I've been around crows my whole life, and every hawk I've ever seen, whether it's in a raptor center or in my backyard or wherever, just seems way, way bigger than a crow. So I'm wondering, what am I missing about this comparison between hawks and crows? Well, your, your number one uh, exhibitor it, uh, it, the default is exhibitor in Caldwell County, uh, the bird is the uh, Cooper's hawk, sure. and he is sure. about a crow size. Sure. Uh, but, it, but the wingspan is a lot bigger, or what, what am I missing about that comparison? Because they just don't seem the same. Size well, that they when, when you see crows, they really don't have the wing spread which is the main difference, and I, I know exactly what you're talking about because I've puzzled over the same thing, but the wing of a hawk is much larger than a crow's wing. Crows, <coughs> crows fly with a swimming kind of a motion, and they use their wings entirely differently. You don't see crows soaring, you don't see crows hunting from a big perch, this kind of thing. That has so it's the body. If, the, well, the if, body you, if you spread the eagle them, they would probably be similar in, in wingspan, but you rarely ever see a crow spread eagle like you do a hawk. So, because like Bob was saying, they, they fly pretty much almost like they're swimming. So A uh, sharp, sharp shinned hawk, which is an exhibitor at the bottom of the center column, is listed here as nine to 13 inches in length. Well, that's definitely in the crow range. However, when you see one, it takes up a lot more room in the sky than a crow does, just because of the broadness of the feathers and the wings and the way they're laid out. Any other questions? Thank you, Wetzel. This lady right here. Can you bring the mic up, please, Jeff? Yeah. Yes. I like to see hawks. You like to see them? Yeah, I see hawks. Okay. Uh, that, that's my favorite team, see hawks. Okay. That's great. And, and, and it appears this year we've had more red-shouldered hawks in our neighborhoods than in years past. It, years past it seemed like the red-tailed hawks were prevalent, but now it just seems that, to, from my observation, is that the red-shouldered hawks, which, which have a very nice, in the spring, you can tell red-shouldered hawks because they're, they're in pairs and they, they like to fly around. It's sort of a courtship ritual and they call each other. And that's the red-shouldered hawks that you, if you observe them in April and May when the, the mating ritual is going on. Uh, and if you hear a scream in your neighborhood, usually it's the red-shouldered hawk sounding off. These birds have different habitats as well. Red-shouldered hawks like to hunt and live along streams and valleys. Red-tailed hawks, the one that you see a lot when you're out on a trip driving somewhere and you see them sitting on trees and all by the highway, like to hunt the high parts of the ridges and all, so they don't really conflict with each other very much because they have different habitats that they seek out. Bob, More questions? I, I think we've pretty much uh, outlived our usefulness here, if you want to call us that. <laughs> we thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And turn it back to Cindy. Let's slip over here and let Miss Cindy have the mic.
Thank you, uh, Mr. Hines and Mr. Holland. I appreciate it. Um, I was in Canada this summer, Prince Edward Island, and got to hold and feed a hawk and a falcon. And they're very lightweight. They look heavy, but they're very lightweight. And if you ever get a chance to do that, do so. Feeding them outside, you put the food in the glove, hold them out, look over your left shoulder, he comes to land. Jamie, our host, trains, he uh, has a hunting license. He also takes his birds to the airports because they scare out all the other birds so they don't get into the planes. And I'm sure Captain Sully would have loved to have had the, those birds around when he had to land his plane in the uh, Hudson. But anyway, I have hung, hang glide a couple of times and you get a tiny taste of what it might be like to be that bird. So if you ever get a chance to hang glide, do so. Uh, thank you both. A couple of upcoming events. Uh, August 19, Leanne Walker will be doing a presentation here at 10 o'clock on um, Finding My Father's Voice, a Baseball Love Affair. She is Rue Walker's daughter. So she will be here. She'll do a little presentation. She will have her book for sale and to sign. And then September 15, 16 at 7 o'clock, Bobby Curtis will be doing a pre uh, her one woman show on Nance Dude. That will be coming out in the next few weeks. Information, ticket sales will be done here at the museum. Please come, but I know that's not appropriate for children. It's more adult because she does get pretty blunt <laughs> with, with her story, but it is, a, it is a true story, so please come and support Bobby. If you've never seen her, you will be in for a treat. Um, Several months ago, the museum presented a history walking tour of. She's back there in the back row. Yes, Miss Bobby. Yep. yep, you will. Several months ago, the museum presented a history walking tour of Main Street, Illinois. Mike Gibbons did conduct this tour, and Bill Tate videoed and recorded the dress rehearsal for this. Um, for the, uh, those who were non-walkers, we, uh, they got to see that at 1841 while we were out walking. It would make a great Christmas gift for anyone that you know who maybe wasn't able to attend or who, lived at, who lives out of town. Some of our family members have moved away, so I know they would enjoy that. Uh, it's a wonderful way to remember Lenore. We have a lot here, a lot of history here, a lot of talent here. Please consider purchasing those. They are $15. We do have them over here for sale. Uh, thanks to Bill Tate and Mike Gibbons for donating their time and skills to the museum. We really appreciate it. Now, I hope everyone has a blue ticket. We have some books to give away here. If you don't, if you'll raise your hand, we'll get somebody to give you a ticket. We'll do the last two numbers. We are giving the Anvil of Adversity. If you did not give a ticket, um, We're going to be giving away Anvil of Adversity is a biography of a furniture pioneer by Bill Stevens. This is about the Roy Hills. I have read this and it is a really, really good book. It gives you a whole insight to, to this story. So the first number, be the last two numbers, is 84. Seventy-two. That's seventy-two. <coughs> sixty-five. Who has sixty-five? Anybody? Okay. How about sixty? Yeah. <laughs> 
And 89. Anybody have 89? Okay, again, I appreciate you coming. Uh, Mr. Hines and Mr. Holland will be around. If you have any questions, please uh, ask them. They have some material up here for you to peruse. So, again, thank you for coming. Our next copy with the curator is September 13th. Kevin, <laughs> Lef Kevin Leftwich will be doing some music. He is a local Caldwell County person. He'll also be doing the one in uh, October. He will be doing that one on Caldwell Fisheries and Habitats. That's what he does. Um, so please come in and support those. And again, thank you for coming. <laughs>